Our next speaker is Robert Mirapol, who is the younger son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. In the 1970s, he and his brother successfully sued the FBI and the CIA to force the release of 300,000 previously secret documents about their parents. In 1990, after leaving law practice, uh, Robert founded the Rosenberg Fund for Children and now serves as its executive director. The Rosenberg Fund for Children provides for the educational and emotional needs of both targeted activist youth and children in this country whose parents have been harassed, injured, jailed, lost jobs, or died in the course of their progressive activities. In its, in its 20 year history, the fund has awarded more than $3.5 million in grants to benefit hundreds of children. Robert's memoir, <laughs> An Execution in the Family, was published by St. Martin's Press in 2003. He is also a member of the Board of Directors of the National Committee to Reopen the Rosenberg Case. Well, it's a great great crowd here. Uh, perhaps we need a bigger room and I'm hello to all new friends and old friends and friends from as far away as Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, anyway, uh, in the mid-1970s when I first said in public that we, through the reopening effort, were going to blow the lid off the Rosenberg case, Mort said to me, he responded, we already had blown the lid off the Rosenberg case with the release of Exhibit 8. The release of Exhibit 8, which the government said gave away the secret of the atomic bomb, showed that the core of the government's case was a fraud. And this, by the way, and it's one good thing about a small room, as you can all see it, this is Exhibit A. This is the secret of the atomic bomb. Um, uh, now, whether David Greenglass gave this sketch to the USSR or was forced to draw it by government prosecutors prior to the trial, it is not the secret of the atomic bomb. And that is what Mort and my parents felt the case against them was all about. They were right. That's why there was a death sentence, and that's why we're still talking about the case today. This fraud is why they could deny their guilt. They didn't do it. This is why they could write to me and my brother, my parents could write, quote, always remember that we were innocent and could not wrong our conscience. They were innocent of stealing the secret of the atomic bomb. And I agree that the secret of the atomic bomb is the key fraud in the government's case. And so Bell's admission does nothing to lessen that fraud. And as my brother said, if you read my book, you know I've considered this a real possibility since the 1980s. So what Mort said was not a big traumatic revelation for me, but the grand jury transcripts revealed quite a bit. Now I've read all thousand plus pages, and by the way, if anybody wants to follow along and read those pages themselves, there's some yellow cards up here that you can pick up and they give you web addresses. Um, I've read those thousand pages, and when they were released, uh, the newspapers focused on the fact that Ruth Greenglass, in her grand jury testimony, said absolutely nothing about my mother being present and typing up the notes that accompanied Exhibit 8 that I showed you before. Uh, now, since that was practically the only evidence against my mother, that was a big deal. But the reality is, is having worked through the Freedom of Information Act for many years and forcing the release of a lot of material, we really already knew that. This just proved what we knew. But now even the mainstream media 
began to admit that perhaps there really was no case against Ethel Rosenberg. Now that's a big deal. But other, I think, even more important stuff about the grand jury proceedings uh, were not talked about by the press. And one of them is the fact that not only does Ruth Ringlass not mention my mother's presence at the supposed meeting where the secret of the atomic bomb was transmitted, she doesn't mention Exhibit 8 at all. It's like Exhibit 8 didn't exist. And that's why getting David Greenglass's testimony released as well, because it's still secret, um, is very important. Because if it turns out that neither of them talk about Exhibit 8, it raises the possibility that this whole secret of the atomic bomb was tacked on by the government after the grand jury proceedings or was concocted by the green glasses to save their necks. But the reality is these developments reinforce the key lessons about the Rosenberg case that we already knew. The U.S. government abused its power in truly dangerous ways that are still very relevant today. Those in power who were involved in my parents' case helped to fuel anti-communist hysteria and then capitalized on that political climate by targeting my parents and making them the focus of the Cold, Wars, uh, Cold War era fear and anger. They manufactured testimony and evidence. They arrested Ethel as leverage to get Julius to cooperate with the prosecution and then used their ultimate weapon, the threat of death, to try to extort a confession from my parents and then force them to name others and testify against them. And then they created the myth of a key secret of the atomic bomb, then devised the strategy to make it appear that Julius had sought out and passed that secret and then executed Julius when he refused to cooperate despite knowing that the secret used to justify the death penalty was a prosecution created fallacy. And then they executed my mother when she refused to cooperate despite knowing that she wasn't guilty of the charges and was not an active participant in any espionage activity. All of this is true even if every word of Venona is true and despite anything that Mort said in 2008. And it is past time for the government to admit it and to make amends. But I want to focus on the grand jury transcripts. One of the most striking things about this 100 pages or 1,000 pages of testimony is how little evidence of espionage is presented in them. In fact, the vast majority of the transcript covers the grilling of uncooperative witnesses. There's probably quite a bit of perjury. People denying they were members of the Communist Party when they were. People denying that they knew each other when they did. But that's not evidence of espionage. And there's an awful lot of shredding of the Constitution, badgering people for taking the Fifth Amendment. I want to, uh, let me read to you just a couple of pages from the transcript. This is an interview with a guy named Mark Page, a Communist Party member who rented a room to Julius and Ethel when they first got married. He's being grilled by the prosecutor. Did you meet Rosenberg's parents? Yes. And his family? Does he have some brothers and sisters? I think I met his parents, and I met his sister at one time. I vaguely remember. That's about all I remember. I met his brother, yes, his brother too. Did you know at the time that Julius Rosenberg was interested in the Communist Party? On this question, sir, I am afraid that I will not be able to answer. Question, on what grounds? On the grounds that I am an American citizen, I love my country, and I have a constitutional right not to answer a question that might incriminate me in any way. I asked you if you knew today. Did you ever hear him say he was? Sir, I respectfully, and I am very respectful about it, I am loath to answer for the simple reason that I do not wish to incriminate myself in any way. That's my constitutional right. Question. Well now, didn't I understand you to preface your remarks by saying that you're a loyal American and that you love your country? I do not know whether I said that, but I certainly do. Question. Is this your idea of being a loyal American? Yes, sir. Your refusal to cooperate in the case as serious as you know this one to be? You, 
You are saying I refuse to cooperate. I did not say that. What do you call that? You do not want to give any answers. I want to find out whether Rosenberg admitted he was a communist. Don't you want to protect my constitutional rights? I do. I'm trying to. I am thinking in terms of Rosenberg, not of you. I am thinking in terms of my country and myself. Thinking in terms of your country, you do not want to tell me about Rosenberg. In thinking about my country, I have to think about myself, too. You may give this kind of double talk outside of this, in the circles that you travel, but here there are people who understand English the same as I do. I am quite respectful, sir, but I rest on my answer. You say that would tend to incriminate you? I say that is my constitutional right. In other words, it might be a constitutional right for me to ask the grand jury to indict you along with Rosenberg? Is that what you're trying to tell us? No, I am not telling you that at all. You are, in effect, saying that. If you say you testify, it is liable to incriminate you. <coughs> I am trying to make a living. For a few years, I've been hounded from job to job. I've been working in toy factories. I did a good job in the Navy. I don't see why you have to hound me like this. I have a family and a responsibility to them. I can't answer a question on the grounds that it might incriminate me. Grand jury forum, foreman. Why would it incriminate you? Because the question concerning those things and the whole situation, it is something I read in the papers. I can read just as well as the gentlemen of the jury and the ladies of the jury, foreman. But you had nothing to do with it. Why do you refuse to help? I do not wish to answer any questions which will tend to incriminate me, and I believe it is a constitutional right. There is no question about it. Prosecutor, you learned that long before you came in this room. Witness, I am trying to lead a simple life. I have been trying, grand jury foreman. Let's stop all this business. We are all trying to lead a simple life. As a matter of fact, we all wish to, but we've been called from our businesses. It is our patriotic duty. We are loyal Americans. We assume you are. Let's forget about being a poor boy. I was a poor boy, too. And it goes on and on like this, page after page after page after page. This person is only guilty of associating with Julius Rosenberg. He was never indicted for anything. I don't even know what happened to him. Uh, and when you read the transcript, you can't tell if most of those interviewed are guilty of anything more than associating with Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel. And perhaps that's why only a very few of those called to the grand jury, almost four dozen of them, end up testifying at my parents' trial. But these transcripts do reveal, when you look at the totality of the people who are being interviewed, a vibrant, young, activist community of people working, coming out of the Depression, coming out of poverty, and doing what they can to make an impact on the world. So this grand jury, in doing this work, was not only seeking out illegal activity. What they were doing was actively to trying to destroy activist community. And Grand juries have a history of this. They did this with SDS in the 60s. They did it with the Black Panther parties in the 70s. They did it to the Puerto Rican nationalists. And they're doing it to the Green Scare defendants to this day. Now, perhaps some of you in this room, with all the urgent civil liberties and human rights cases to attend to today, wonder why we should spend time on a case that's now over 60 years old. Well, the new developments have valuable lessons to teach us about today, or the understanding of this case do. There are several important parallels between my parents' case and the anti-terrorism cases of today, even though politically my parents, who were secular <coughs> Jewish communists, couldn't be further apart from those who are targeted as Islamic fundamentalists. But if you step back for a minute and you look at the parallels in more general terms, in my parents' case, the government linked the thing the public feared the most, the atomic bomb, to the people the public feared the most at that time, communists. And it happened during war. Thousands were dying in Korea. And now the government is taking the thing the public fears the most, weapons of mass destruction, and are linking it to the people the public fears the most, Islamic fundamentalists. And since our aggression in Iraq and Afghanistan, the US is in a perpetual state of war. And the politically charged atmosphere of the 1950s made it impossible to save my parents' lives. Similarly, the atmosphere during the Bush administration years made it a daunting challenge to meet, to protect the human rights of those who faced terror charges. And by now, we all know that the Obama administration seems to be following much the same course. So the lessons of my parents' case haven't really been learned. But we've got a mountain of proof about the Rosenberg case. 
And that's very valuable for convincing people. And with that proof, we can provide a powerful object lesson to demonstrate that we are going down the wrong path in this country. We have an uphill battle to restore civil liberties and respect for human rights in our nation. We need every ounce of ammunition we can lay our hands on. And exploring what happened in my parents' case will give us plenty. Thank you.